Well, very often, most of the time in this first segment, I go on and on and on about some subject that's been on my mind. And I don't have any giant, profound things to say tonight. But there are several things that have happened in the last week or two that bear some comments. So let's see if we can run through them. Probably the most earth-shaking thing that happened over the past week or so occurred eight days ago in Milwaukee. George Bush made a startling statement in a speech to a business group in Milwaukee when he as much as said that America is not a free country. And believe me, I was floored when I heard this and when I read the exact words in the speech on the transcript that's on the White House website. What he said, and I quote exactly, free nations don't develop weapons of mass destruction. Now, what country in the world has the biggest arsenal of weapons of mass destruction? Nuclear weapons, biological weapons, chemical weapons? Well, in every one of those departments, the good old U.S. of A. is number one. And if George Bush believes that free nations don't develop weapons of mass destruction, then he must believe that America is not a free nation. Now, you may find that trivial, but I find that to be very, very, very significant that our president has finally acknowledged that this is not a free country. And since it's not a free country, he can lock up people without any warrant, without any access to an attorney or one's family, keep them there indefinitely, never bring them to trial, ignore the Bill of Rights completely, do anything that he wants, because he is the ruler of this non-free country. And now it is out in the open. That entire speech, incidentally, of George Bush's is on my website. I have what I call the Radio Links page, where you can get links to any article or website that I might mention on the broadcast so that I don't have to read out long addresses on the show here. In any event, just go to my website, harrybrown.org, go to the radio page, and you'll see a link to the Radio Links page, where you'll see links to several items that I've put up for this evening. Another big story this past week, of course, you heard about Rush Limbaugh acknowledging that he is addicted to painkillers. And I certainly wouldn't be the first person to point out the hypocrisy of somebody who is all in favor of very strict sentences for people who commit offenses against the drug laws in this country to then turn out to be somebody who is using drugs himself. But of course, he said the reason was that he had spinal surgery and he needed it for the pain. It was either that or submit to more surgery, which he did not want to do. Well, of course, there are a lot of people in this country who have wanted to use marijuana, for example, let alone heavier drugs, to try to relieve pain or some other medical condition. In her excellent article, The Invisible Hand is a Gentle Hand, Sharon Harris gave us several examples, and that article is also on the Radio Links page, and it is a fantastic article, uh, quite lengthy, but it gives so many examples of the comparison between the compassionate free market and the iron fist of government. Here are just a few of them. James Burton is now living in the Netherlands because he was arrested for using and growing marijuana to try to treat what he has, which is a rare form of hereditary glaucoma. And his doctor even told him that marijuana was the only thing that could probably help him, and the doctor so testified at his trial, but he was sentenced to one year in a federal maximum security prison with no parole. And as soon as he got out, he took off for the Netherlands, and he had to because the government in the meantime had seized his house and his farm, a 90-acre farm under asset forfeiture, and there was no defense he could raise against the seizure of his property. No defense witnesses were permitted at the hearing or anything else. Will Foster, a 38-year-old father of three, grew marijuana in his basement to treat his severe rheumatoid arthritis. Police raided his home and found 70 marijuana plants. Because he was a first-time offender, the judge let him off with a 93-year sentence. Jimmy Montgomery of Oklahoma was sentenced to 10 years in prison for possession of two ounces of marijuana. That's the same weight that you find in the tobacco in two packs of cigarettes. Montgomery used the marijuana because he was a paralegic and had been so for 20 years, and he found that marijuana was the only thing that relieved painful muscle spasms in his paralyzed legs. His harsh sentence came because he was convicted for both possession and intent to distribute, and that was based on the testimony of a cop who said he had never seen anyone with two ounces or more who didn't intend to distribute, therefore he was a dealer as well as a user, and went to prison for 10 years. And the stories go on and on and on. Lonnie Lundy got a 10-year sentence, uh, pardon me, a life sentence for dealing drugs on the testimony of one witness and no evidence of any physical kind whatsoever. One witness who recanted his sex testimony afterward. What well, goes on and on. So no matter what Rush Limbaugh's condition, he really can't say that he had an unusual circumstance because Limbaugh has been preaching against relieving these people of these harsh sentences in the past. Now, Limbaugh isn't the first hypocrite in the war on drugs. When Lonnie Lundy was sentenced to a year in prison, his father wrote to his U.S. senator, Senator Richard Shelby of Alabama, a Republican, 
and pleaded with him to intervene and provide some help. But Senator Shelby wrote back and said, drug abuses and drug-related crimes are among the greatest ills that plague our nation. We must take a strong stand against drugs, and I support strict punishment for individuals involved in the possession or distribution of illegal drugs. While I understand your concerns about mandatory penalties for nonviolent offenders, I believe that our nation's drug problem is serious enough to warrant harsh sentences. Well, five months after writing that letter, Senator Shelby's 32-year-old son was arrested at the Atlanta airport with 13 grams of hashish in his possession. He pleaded guilty to a minor misdemeanor possession charge, paid fines totaling $860, performed 40 hours of community service, and was on probation for one year. He didn't spend a single hour in jail or prison. Representative uh, Randy Cunningham of California, another Republican, needless to say, used to write articles for the San Diego Union and other places saying such things as, quote, we must reverse the Clinton record, 80% cuts in the Office of National Drug Control Policy staff, fewer drug enforcement agents, reduced drug interdiction efforts, declining drug prosecutions, reduced mandatory minimum sentences for drug trafficking and soft-on-crime liberal judges. Well, you can guess what happened next. His son was arrested. And the son was arrested for having 400 pounds of marijuana. 400 pounds! That does seem to be a little bit more than two ounces, so he must be a dealer. But, of course, the father pleaded with the judge, saying, oh, he's a good boy, he has a good heart, he works hard, he's expressed to me he wants to go back to school, he's never been in trouble before. And so the judge took it all to heart. The son received a sentence of only two and a half years, which is half the mandatory sentence, and then he was given the opportunity to reduce the sentence to 18 months by completing a drug rehabilitation program while in prison. In fact, the prosecutors had originally offered a sentence of only 14 months, but while the son was out on bail, he tested positive for cocaine three different times. Did he go to prison for life without parole? Of course not. Well, you can go on and on with this. Capitol Hill Blue, a Washington publication, found that 14 members of the current Congress, this was back in 1998, had been arrested on drug-related charges. Now, why don't you guess how many of them ever served a day in prison? Well, I think you get the point. The, hop the hypocrisy is tremendous. And I can almost guarantee you that Rush Limbaugh will never serve a day in prison for abusing drugs, as they say, for violating the drug laws, the very laws that he thinks need to be enforced in a more harsh way. The fact is there shouldn't be any drug laws, and when there were no drug laws, there was less drug abuse, less drug addiction, less violence, less drug dealers. There were no metal detectors in schools. There was no police co corruption in the drug world. None of those things existed when there were no drug laws. And if we want a drug-free America, the first step would be to get rid of the drug laws. This is Harry Brown. Also this past week, the House Committee that covers such things, I forget the name of it, uh, reported out by a very strong majority a bill giving the Bush administration $87 billion for the reconstruction of Iraq. And there's been a lot of argument lately that the media is reporting only the bad news about the way things are going in Iraq, and they're not reporting all the good stuff about the schools that have been repaired and opened for business and the hospitals that have been fixed up and the places in Iraq that do have electricity and all these other good things that our soldiers are achieving over there. Pardon me, but when did the American taxpayers become responsible for building schools in Iraq? and seeing that the hospitals are working correctly, and getting electricity functioning over there. Now, some people may say, well, it is the responsibility of the American taxpayers because it was American taxpayer money that destroyed the country in the first place. And I understand that argument. But that's not the way the Bush people see it. That's not the way a lot of the media reports it. The media are telling us that these things are functioning better than they ever have before, that things were in such disrepair under Saddam Hussein that the... United States is giving the Iraqi people things that they never had before, at least not in the last several decades. Of course, after the Gulf War, the electricity was also out, and under Saddam Hussein's tyrannical rule, they got the electricity functioning in the entire country again within two months. It's been more than two months in Iraq after this war, and it hasn't happened yet. But we still come back to the point, it isn't the responsibility of American taxpayers to be paying to fix up schools and hospitals and buildings and all of these other things and to provide jobs for all the Iraqi people. My heavens, I mean, I don't even think it's your responsibility to be building schools in this country. It should be the responsibility of entrepreneurs who build schools, open them, and then appeal to you for your business. Fat chance that that's going to happen in the near future. There was a garbage strike in Illinois this past week. You may have heard about it. Garbage was stinking up the streets because it had been sitting out on the sidewalks and on, in alleys and in other places for over a week and just driving people crazy. And, of course, if a Martian were to land here and he had some idea of how the market system works, he'd say, well, 
when your garbage company is out on strike, why don't you just call another garbage company and get them to come over? Well, the garbage company is unionized, and the union won't let them do that. Well, just call a non-union company. Well, it doesn't work that way because the city assigns a franchise to your area. That means you can only deal with one company in that area. And, of course, one of the requirements in most cities is that the garbage collectors be unionized. So you are at the mercy, not just of the unions, but of your own city government. And if they go out on strike, you're stuck. And if your garbage company gives you poor service, you're stuck. Fortunately, I happen to live in a town next to Nashville, Tennessee, in an area where there are no exclusive franchises for garbage disposal companies. As a result, we've been living here for eight years and using the same disposal company for eight years. Their service is spectacular. They come twice a week. We don't have to wheel the garbage cans out to the curb or anything of the sort. They come right up to the side of the house, pick up the garbage, and take it away. We never see them, and they charge us $20 a month for this, to pick up eight or nine times a month. I looked in the phone book today. There are 16 trash disposal companies in this area. So it's not surprising that ours is so good because if they're not, there are 15 competitors waiting to take business away from them. Why in the world should any city be assigning franchises that give exclusive exclusive monopolies to trash disposal companies, to cable companies, TV cable companies, to electric companies, to water companies? There is absolutely no reason for it. If it seems that there is a reason, that you can only have one set of cables laid, that only one set of water pipes, it's because you have never lived in a city where that isn't the case. There are several cities, big cities in this country today, that have competitive TV cable companies, for instance. Each one of them lays cable around the city, and nobody complains that there are too many cable companies laying cable and tying up the streets or anything else. And as a result, prices in those cities are much lower than they are in the cities where exclusive franchises are granted. And not only that, of course, the service is better. So this garbage strike in Illinois just simply highlights another defect in asking government to take care of things for you. Government is not the solution. Government is not the regulator. Government is not the agency that keeps people in line. It isn't government that prevents fraud in the marketplace. If you have one honest company in any market, it drives the bad companies out of business because they can't compete. They can't prove their honesty because they're not honest, but the honest company can. Before we go to the phone, just a couple of emails. Before the show started, I received an email from Brian out there in cyberspace saying, Harry, now be nice to Rush tonight. (laughs) I guess he knew that there was going to be something said about it. And I want to make it clear that I do not blame Rush Limbaugh in any way whatsoever for what he did with the drugs. Whether he did the right thing or the wrong thing for his own body is not for me to say, but it's also not for George Bush or John Ashcroft or any U.S. attorney to say. Jan in Fort Collins writes and says, did Rush Limbaugh actually break any laws in connection with his drug addiction? That I don't know. I have not heard any commentator on television or any writer on the Internet mention either that there was a particular law that was broken or that this was not a violation of the law but perhaps an unethical thing to do or in some other way refer incidentally to the fact that he was not breaking the law. I tend to think that there must be laws that were broken there, and I'm quite sure that there are people who have gone to jail. It isn't just, I guess they call them class one drugs like cocaine and bead and crack and so forth that can send you to prison. It can also be overusing prescription drugs buying them without a prescription, which is what he did by getting his housekeeper to obtain them. And I don't see how his housekeeper could have gotten prescriptions for all the drugs that she got for him because it apparently was a ton of drugs. So she must have bought them in the black market. And because he was her customer, she's a dealer and he's a user of drugs that were illegally obtained. obtained. So he must have broken some laws, but I can't tell you specifically what the ordinances are. And again, I say I really, really doubt that he will ever spend a day in prison or even in jail, even overnight in a holding cell. All right, let's see what's going on out in the real world. Let's talk to Richard in California. Good evening, Richard. How are you tonight, Harry? Well, my back's bothering me a little. The dog pooped on the floor in my office, and the cat threw up in the living room. But other than that, I'm fine. Thanks very much. Maybe some drugs that would help. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe I should. (laughs) Well, I was fascinated. I just happened upon, in my Internet surfing, uh, the Aztec culture. And there they believed that they needed to make human sacrifices in order to keep the sun on its path every day. And I was thinking about our culture that is so terrified that if we don't have a central organizing authority, that the world will just fall apart if the government doesn't provide jobs or education or retirement, medical care, or whatever. And I was thinking, how is that different? You know, that we have to sacrifice half of our lives now to the government on the productivity. And I can't figure out how different that is in the, 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 the Aztec culture where they were taking people and slaughtering them. Now, of course, they don't kill most of us here, but in terms of the methodology to, just to keep the world going, 
it seems like it's the same kind of a myth. Well, two comments right off the bat before you go on. Number one, we look at what the Aztecs did as an unfortunate superstition that hurt people very, very badly, killing innocent people, and we say it's terrible that they had that superstition. But there is a superstition pre prevalent in the United States today, and that is that if you send marijuana users off to prison for 90 years, if you uh, crack down on people, plant evidence, do whatever you have to do to get drug dealers rounded up and put people who use drugs, even marijuana, in prison and fear the wrath of the state, that somehow we will have a drug-free society, which is as superstitious and so disproven by reason as the Aztecs thinking that by sacrificing virgins, they were keeping the sun moving on its path around the earth. The other uh, comment that I might make is that even today there are exceptions in the drug laws for some Indians, and I hope I have this correct. If anybody wants to correct me, I welcome their comments, but I believe there are ex exceptions in the drug laws for Native American tribes in the United States who still use peyote as some kind of religious right. And since it is freedom of religion in this country, supposedly, uh, they get to do that. So maybe if we would form a church, the first church of cocaine or something <laughs> of that sort, then maybe we could break through these drug laws. Not that I'm in any hurry to use cocaine, I can tell you. I have enough trouble with a glass of wine or not or non-alcoholic beer, but still, you get my point. Yeah, it just seems to me that when you're terrified the Sunday won't come up tomorrow, you'll do anything. If you're terrified that you'll retire poor and without medical care or you're terrified that the drug users will overcome the world. or it, it, That kind of fear, once you get to that point and then somebody offers a solution, much like the medicine man did or, you know, back at the turn of the century, that that fear loses its sight of rationality, and you will do anything it takes to alleviate that psychological fear. And if that's given control of the economy or our morality to the government, it's so hard to break that fear because it's not rational. It's so emotionally connected. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's a very good point. And, of course, that's what's happening with the war on terrorism that if we don't give up our civil liberties, we are going to lose this country to terrorists who somehow have the ability to take over all of us. Just as in World War II, if we didn't go to war, the Nazis were going to demolish the Brits and then come over here and invade the United States, and boy, we'd all be speaking German today, and on and on. And of course, it goes uh, not just in war, not just in the drug war, but as you say, with things like if you don't submit to what the government wants, you're going to be without medical care in your old age, and you're going to die a horrible death. So we need to give the government more power in Medicare and all these other places. So much of it is based on fear. So many laws are passed in haste uh, because of this emotional trauma that's created by some single event that may be nothing. The SARS epidemic, for instance. I don't know how many people exactly have been afflicted with it in the United States, but it's on the order of a 1,000 or 2,000. And again, if anybody has more explicit figures, I welcome their comments. But the point is that the Congress people are already rushing to try to figure out some kind of new laws and other things to prevent this sort of thing. And, of course, those new laws will just make it harder for us to be able to be treated for real diseases, for us to live our lives as we're supposed to be living them because of these new laws that are going to prevent something that was once in a hundred shot, actually once in a million shot, and on top of that probably won't work anyway. Let me throw you a softball, then. What, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what if, in fact, people get used to this very complex system of donating to the priests and they keep the sun coming up tomorrow and they can't imagine what the world would be like without it? How do you alleviate your fears or... How do you communicate to them the fact that, in fact, it will be a glorious day, you know, without the government running and being responsible for the bulk of our lives? Well, a mistake that is easy to make, I believe, is to feel that you must explain everything to somebody, that unless you can go into natural law or uh, the history of the Constitution or all of these other things, that people will not respond and will not agree with us. But, in fact, you have to get their attention first. And you don't get their attention by giving them a long academic lecture. And that's why I believe it's important to point to the things that people can grasp immediately that could be so much better in their lives if they were willing to give up some of the government. And that doesn't mean they'll convert to your side immediately, but you have their attention. That's why I like to ask people, what would you do if we repealed the Social Security and income taxes so that you, as an average family in this country, would have at least $10,000 a year more to spend? Put your child in a private school, contribute to your favorite cause or charity or your church or whatever you want to do, start your own business, have a much, much more secure retirement and so forth, and go down the line with certain benefits of these kinds. And the person may think they're too good to be true. They may think a lot of different things. But the fact is that you now have their attention, and four out of five people are going to want to know more, want to look into it further, just in case you do happen to be right about this, that we could survive without the income tax, and that if we didn't have Social Security, old people might be better off than they are now. And now you've got somebody that you can engage in a dialogue on a little deeper basis. But if you try to tell them the whole story at the outset, lay all the premises, and do all the other things, all you're going to do is get eyes glazing over. Richard, thanks so much for calling. Well, thanks. Enjoy the conversation. You take care. You too. All right, let's go to New Orleans and talk with Harvey. Harvey, are you with us this evening? Sir? Harvey, is that you? Yes, sir. Oh, good to hear from you. How are you doing? 
Oh, not too good. I got a toothache. <laughs> oh, well, I know somebody can get some drugs for you. No, Lord, no. I, uh, uh, but she was the housekeeper for a famous radio host, but oh. I think she's probably lost her job now. True, you just can't get good hired help. <laughs> no, you can't. You can't. <laughs> what's, what's what happened to loyalty? <laughs> yes. Well, okay, I've got a couple questions. Um, first one, um, do you have to sort your gar- uh, garbage uh, as for the recycling? Oh, no, I don't, thank goodness. Everything goes into the, it. In the state of Tennessee, they have not made that a law yet. We just throw everything in the trash uh, bag. And the, the hardest task of all is carrying that trash bag about 50 feet from our kitchen to the uh, trash cans that we have uh, by the side of the house. It seems like uh, our friend Al, uh, who, uh, 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 as I recall, had a um, interest, uh, family interest in a mining uh, uh, operation that was polluting rivers, even though he wrote a book about all you know, all this uh, revitalization. And, uh, sure. Yeah, so uh, maybe. And what was the, maybe what was the title of his book? Uh, environmental something? Murdering the. In- assassinating the internal combustion engine, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that was the meaning. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now uh, on this, uh, my. Uh, I, uh, our good friend uh, of liberal persuasion, uh, who, uh, uh, well, he can't call in right now, uh, uh, assailed me with the news that uh, he was outraged that Brechtel and. Uh, who's the other that. Brechtel? Halliburton? Halliburton has been given a big, huge tax break, and he was infuriated. He says, how these big companies don't deserve this big tax break? And anyway, they shouldn't have been given the contract. Well, I, I pointed out to him that in the first place, as far as I know, uh, Albert, uh, and definitely uh, Brechtel, their offices are now in England. They've transferred most of their operations there. Most of the stuff they do is subcontracting, and I don't know if if, if I had to do the job in Iraq, I would have, you know, and somebody would ask me, well, if they were oil well fires, I'd have called rel- uh, right off the top of my head. I'd have called rel- right there, and as far as the you know, construction, those are the, the two biggest companies I know of that do get the job done. Mm-hmm. So uh, I presume, I, if, you know, if somebody would have asked me offhand, and, and I would have said, well, I guess they, you know, I would have called them. But well, anyway, but you got to understand that America is built, and the free market is built on the concept of value for value. And yeah. Halliburton and Bechtel bought and paid for a president, and they they are <laughs> entitled to get good value for that. So uh, if, if you're trying if you're trying to tear down the free enterprise system, then we just can't have that. On this show. Well, what happened to Andy Jackson's uh, "To the Victors Belong the Spoils"? Well, mean, of course, our friend, wants, our friend wants to rewrite history or throw out a uh, good history. I mean, Harvey, Har- Harvey, pardon me for interrupting you. We've got to take a break, but we're yes, going to be back in just a couple of minutes. Hang on. Uh, anything further you want to add, Harvey? Yes, sir. I want to ask you uh, whether you are uh, completely against uh, corporate taxes, or you think that some should be uh, collected. Uh, uh, for the purpose of proper overseeing and, re- and regulation to assure that uh, monopolies don't form, and to what percent would you think would be a fair percentage? And the other question is, if you know why uh, we're not getting a good rate, a good, nice cheap uh, rate on this Iraqi oil to help pay for our investment in their infrastructure. Well, because nothing ever works out the way the pro- politicians promised that it would. And so all that business about the Iraqi uh, oil financing the reconstruction turned out not to be so. But that's the way all these things are, whether you're talking about wars or Medicare or anything else, the promises they make uh, are seen five years later or five months later or even sometimes five days later to be not the case, but they just go on to something else. As far as corporate taxes are concerned, I believe in a flat tax, as long as the tax is zero. And I believe in a, a zero flat tax for everybody. Corporations, individuals, flat tax of zero on gifts, estates, the whole works. I don't believe there should be any income taxes of any kind whatsoever, and we wouldn't need any income taxes of any kind whatsoever if the government would fit within the Constitution as it once did, because we only need about $100 billion to defend this country accurately, operate a federal judiciary system, and the one or two other functions that the Constitution actually authorizes. As far as overseeing corporations is concerned, that's what the market does. When corporations abuse their uh, positions in the marketplace, other corporations see this as an opportunity to provide you a safer alternative or a cheaper alternative or a better servicing alternative or in whatever way it is that a corporation is deficient, other corporations see that as an opportunity. It's the same with individuals competing with each other for jobs or as self-proprietorships for uh, contracts and things of this sort. That's the way the market works. But when you turn the governance of the market over to the politicians, then it's no longer a market matter. It's no longer a matter of efficiency or cost or anything else. It is now a political issue to be decided by people like Teddy Kennedy or Newt Gingrich or whoever it may be. It will be decided by those with the most political influence, and I can guarantee you, that it will never be you and it will never be I. Thanks so much for calling, Harvey. I appreciate it. Let's go right back to New Orleans and talk with Jeffrey. Good evening, Jeffrey. Hi. I have three reports to give you, and I'll be brief. One last week, we had the first of two primaries for governor and state offices. I did not vote for any of the candidates there because all 18 of them were statists and favored big government and less individual responsibility, so I just let them go. 
Second, you're, talking, you're talking about a Louisiana primary? That's right, the first Louisiana primary. The second primary is going to be November 15, but both of the candidates are for big governments. I'm not going for either one. That's the runoff between the two highest. Yeah, Booby, Booby Jendal and Kathleen Blavino Blackout, or Blanco, as she calls herself. Okay, what's what's second on your list? On the September the 7th of this year, George Bush, in his speech, made a little notice statement that we actually went into Iraq in conformance with Article 25 of the U.N. Charter, giving the president control of the Army, which is in violation of Article 1, Section 8, that says Congress shall, make, shall have the power to make war. Now, you say this was in a speech on September 7th. Yes, this is a speech where Bush asked for the, um, for the appropriation for Iraq. Okay. Okay, do, do you happen to know to whom he was speaking at the time, what the event was? This was this was a press conference. This was a speech and a press conference combined before the Congress. Okay, I'll look that up during now, the news break. Now, number three, next week we're going to have the 45th anniversary of the John Birch Society in Appleton, Wisconsin. I'm going to be going there, and if I have time, I'll be able to give you a further report on that. It's going to be in Appleton Friday and Saturday. There are going to be all kinds of tours, speeches, and events going on in that area. So I just wanted to let you know that that is taking place next Saturday, Friday and Saturday, the 17th and 18th. All right, well, I hope you have a good time, Jeffrey. Yeah. And before we go back to the phones, let me just deal with a couple of emails. Bob asks, would you consider any of the current U.S. private school corporations to be a good investment? Any investment advice for those of us that believe in private schools? Well, you would have to investigate the schools and ask yourself whether you think that buying stock in one of them would be a good, not an investment, a speculation. Anytime you're trying to beat the market, you are speculating rather than investing. And I have never bothered to look into it, so I can't give you any advice on that. You do need to understand that there is a difference between supporting something because you're ideologically in favor of it and supporting something because you want to make money on it. And sometimes you can combine the two, but you should never confuse them. You should only invest in something with money that is precious to you if you see it as the best alternative. And I do not agree with any of these mutual funds who are what they call socially responsible, that will only invest in companies they consider green, that will not invest in tobacco companies, that will not invest in liquor companies, and have all kinds of other rules. What they are doing is limiting the alternatives available to them. They say that investing in socially responsible companies is good business. Well, then it, if it is, it means that those happen to be money-making companies, and the fact that they're socially responsible is irrelevant. You either have to invest to make money, or you are investing to support things you believe in, in which case it is a form of charity. But you can't just automatically decide that investing in things you believe in is going to be the best choice available. If it isn't the best choice and you know that, then you are sacrificing something for your beliefs. And that's all right. I gave six years of my life to run for president. But I knew what I was doing. I never kidded myself that this was <laughs> a money-making opportunity. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, enough of that. Let's go to California and talk with Chuck. Good evening, Chuck. Well, Harry. How are you this evening, and what's on your mind? Well, I, I wanted to, um, I think we can both agree that there is a definite relationship between man exercising rights and his uh, level of prosperity. Do we agree on that? Well, I happen to believe that libertarianism is not just a political philosophy, it is a way of life, and I wrote a book called How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World, in which I tried to apply, show how libertarian principles apply in one's personal life to improve your life, to raise your standard of living, to get better friends and better business opportunities and so forth, and so I believe that. Now, do you want to restate the way you put it again about rights? That there is a, uh, there is a relationship between man's exercising his rights and prosperity. Are you talking about prosperity for society or an individual person who individual. exercises his rights? Individual. Uh, well, why don't you give us an example, and that'll well, probably uh, clear it up. What I wanted to say was I see there are five levels of rights that have been experienced on this planet since history has been recorded. It starts out with might makes right. People did things because they could. And then it evolved into what we now call the divine right of kings. In other words, mm -hmm. people tell you what to do. Not because they are smart or strong, it's because, you know, God they've, put them there. They've been appointed by God, yes. Right, and then, then the level of rights that, we, that we've experienced in this country called inalienable rights, that's where rights are assumed. But then the fourth level is civil rights, 1964, with our President Johnson. And now there is a fifth level of rights, that's with the Patriot Act, where even some of those rights are removed from us. Does this mean that prosperity is on the way out? Well, I think the prosperity has been on the way out for about 30 years. I discussed this a few weeks ago on the show, and you can go to my website, harrybrown.org, and one of the articles linked on the home page is what happened to the U.S. economy, yeah, which, yeah. Which, which I go into how it has uh, really slowed down over the last 30 years. But this may shock you, and it may shock other listeners also, but I don't happen to believe in natural rights or human rights of any kind whatsoever. Hmm. They, they are an artificial construct, and that's why Jesse Jackson says you have a right to a job, and somebody else says you have a right to life, liberty, and property. Uh, it's just a question of might makes right. Whether we like it or not, that's the way the world works, even though we don't 
necessarily consider that to be a good system. I believe that rights play an important part in mutually agreed to contracts. If you and I decide to go into business together, we draw up a contract, usually written, sometimes just uh, oral, but basically a contract that says, these are your responsibilities, these are mine. This is what you can take from the business, this is what I can take from the business. And therefore, within this contract, I have a right to this or I have a right to that. We have both acknowledged it. And because we both acknowledged it, we can function that way. Now, what happened in the American Revolution was that the country was uh, control of the country was gained by people who believed in the kind of rights that you like and which if I have to agree to somebody's rights, I would agree to also and say, yes, I like these rights a lot better than Jesse Jackson's concept of rights. And so for a 100 years or so, the country prospered, the country was basically free, and a lot of good things happened as a result of that might being on the side of the kind of rights that we like. But eventually, the politicians found a way to get around it, and then rights became a free-for-all. I have a right to this. No, you don't have a right to that. Well, yeah, I have a right to this and so but on. But Harry, uh, then what makes murder against the law? Just because right? somebody passed a law and said so. I don't believe in murder. I don't believe that I ever want to kill somebody, even in self-defense. I don't want to be put in that position because there are bad consequences to me of doing that. But all the talk in the world about you not having any right to murder me is not going to do me any good if you are determined to murder me. And if there is a law against it and a death penalty and you are still determined to murder me, my right to life is not doing me any good. The only thing that's doing me good is finding a way to protect myself from you, and I can't count on the government for it, even if the government supposedly acknowledges that I have a right to life, liberty, and property. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't usually get into this because yeah. it's, a re it's almost a religious matter with people. But, of course, we can't function if we don't have a concept of rights. But all we're talking about is that you have a concept of rights, somebody else has a concept of rights, somebody else has a concept of rights, and each person wants his concept to prevail. And because it is just a concept, it isn't permanent. It's transitory. Somebody has the upper hand right now, and so that kind of rights prevails. And maybe next year or next century or whatever it might be, somebody else's concept will prevail. But it is really a religious thing. It is something that can never be proved to the satisfaction of everybody. Ayn Rand and uh, Robert Lefebvre and a lot of other libertarians in history have written long treatises explaining that the only rights are life, liberty, and property. But in effect, you had to take a great deal of what they said on faith. You had, and you took it on faith because you agreed with the conclusion. So when I say you, I'm not talking about yeah. you, Chuck. I'm talking about one. Well, uh, anybody reading it would agree uh, with it if he happened to agree with the conclusions. And then he would applaud and say, oh, this is the most devastating article I've ever read that explains exactly why man has only three rights to life, liberty, and, and property, and everything else is just bogus. But somebody else will read that and say, that's hogwash. <laughs> you know, that's crazy, man. Um, and all you can do is shout louder than the other person, and that's really what price comes down to, is who can shout the loudest. What, what about the concept of we own our own bodies? Well, that's something you either believe or you don't believe. And the fact that you believe it, imposes no obligation on somebody who doesn't believe it. We have to take a break. I've lost track of the time. We'll be right back. Uh, an email from Dave in Phoenix. Some examples of extraordinary popular delusions. In the year 1200, you can make gold from lead. In the year 1400, the earth is flat and is the center of the universe. In the year 2003, government works. And an email from Christopher in Michigan. And it's fairly lengthy, so I can't get into all of the various things that he raises in this. But a couple of points that he makes, which I do not need to comment on because he makes the points very well. First, you once noted, just imagine what computers would be like if we had government regulation of them. I say you don't have to imagine. Just look at the control towers of the many government airports. I was born in 1974, he says, and there are computers that are a decade older than I am, some that still use punch cards to start up. The laptop you have in the studio is far more powerful than those machines they have at the airport. No wonder the airplanes can't, can't get off the ground. And the other point he makes is, he said, yes, on the news just now, here on Radio America he's referring to, they had a sound clip of George Bush talking about the new Iraqi currency. So our government, who can't balance its own checkbook and spends itself into the ground, is going to manage Iraq's currency. Yes, well put, very well put. And, in fact, it is a subject I was going to get into if we had time, I have been saying for I don't know how many years that the budget figures that we get from the government are very misleading, and all those surpluses in the 1990s never existed because all they were doing was taking money from Social Security. And the proof of the fact that we were not having budget surpluses was that every year the federal debt got larger. How can the debt get larger if you're running a surplus? If you're taking in more money than you're paying out, then obviously your total debt is going to decline rather than increase. Well, there finally is some acknowledgement of this in the mainstream press. And this is really the first example of this that I remember seeing. And it came from, uh, from of all places, the New York Times. Howell Jackson wrote an article on October 9th. He's a professor at Harvard Law School, 
and it's entitled It's Even Worse Than You Think. And he was talking about the $400 billion figure, supposedly, of the current deficit, but he goes into the Social Security business, and he says that actually the real deficit is closer to a trillion, but even that's not it, because if proper accounting methods were used, it would take into consideration the liabilities the government is incurring this year in Social Security that it doesn't have the money to pay. And so he says, finally, that the system's current shortfall, that's the Social Security system, its assets minus its liabilities, is $10.5 trillion. And he goes on from there, and he says, finally, the deficit is reported $400 billion. The deficit without stealing from Social Security's cash, $560 billion. The deficit with increase in the Social Security shortfall, in other words, recognizing those liabilities incurred this year, is $930 billion. And, of course, that $400 billion figure has already been up to a half a trillion, so all the other figures would go up, too. So we are talking about a $1 trillion deficit this year. Do you know that in the first 10 or 15 years of the 20th century, the entire budget of the federal government was around a half a billion dollars a year? And now the government is spending twice that every week just in Iraq and is spending 2,000 times that every year more than it is taking in. Let me (laughs) rephrase that to make it clearer. The budget used to be at one time a half a billion dollars a year. Now just the shortfall every year is 2,000 times that much. The entire budget is about over 4,000 times what it was 100 years ago. Something is wrong. And maybe we can find out what's wrong by talking with Larry in Virginia. Good evening, Larry. Yes, sir. How you doing? I'm just fine. What's up tonight? Oh, I was coming down the road listening to your radio show there, and you're talking about Rush Limbaugh and them other fellows that uh, got incarcerated for possession, growing in the basement. Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't that uh, fall under the category of a victimless crime? Oh, definitely. The A victimless crime is, by definition, a crime in which no victim registers a complaint. Nobody comes to the police and says, I am worse off because this person smoked a marijuana cigarette or this person is doing cocaine or this person sold cocaine to someone. Uh, That's a victimless crime. And, in fact, it can be called a crime against the state because it's not a crime against anybody's person or property. It is merely a crime against the state. Uh, On the moxie cottons that Rush Limbaugh was supposedly addicted to, Uh he says he he was addicted to, Um, aren't those those made out of heroin, are they not? Oh, well, the reason I ask is, is because I, I thought I read somewhere where it was a derivative from opium, and opium comes from Afghanistan. And I find that this Afghanistan war, and, well, I should say some of these things probably, but the government that we have running the show up there uh, is in there for, I believe, for the drugs. Is, and that's just legal drug dealing, is it not? When you say legal drug dealing, are you talking about what's happening in Afghanistan or, or what? Well, I'm that's not- where uh, these oxycontins, you know, you have people uh, dying from these things every day. The particular thing that Limbaugh is addicted to uh, has some of these things in it. But, of course, a lot of things do. The the sedatives that are given in hospitals uh, right. very often uh, have morphine, which is an illegal drug, just right. like heroin and some of the others. And so it's just a matter of what the law is at any particular time. As some people have said, it is a war on some drugs. And it depends on how you get the drugs, who you are, and a lot of other things. But that's the way it is. We don't have a rule of law in this country where we know it's the same law for everyone. In various conditions, the same law applies. So it is. that's just the way it is, and that's unfortunate. Well, then we need to stow the power back in the jurors, do we not? Well, that would help. Uh, and the jury, unfortunately, too often gets bamboozled because the judge does not allow the defense to point out certain things, as in that Rosenthal case in the San Francisco-Oakland area last year or earlier this year it was oakland california has medical marijuana legalized a man was growing marijuana under contract from the city of oakland he was hauled into court by the feds and charged with violating federal laws and the judge prohibited the defense from mentioning that what he was doing was not only legal in california but was also being done at the behest of the city of oakland and as a result the man got a sentence of i don't know what it was like two or three years and when the jurors found out afterward what had been prohibited from telling them they were irate and they signed petitions to try to get a retrial but of course they were not successful larry thanks so much for calling thanks for talking and bob having seen a notice from my freedom wire email list today says how are you going to convince the liberals to hang with us libertarians and the point is of course that we simply have to show liberals that war could not exist without big government and I have an article on that on my website this week. If you go to my homepage, it is the lead article. It just came out today, What li- Liberals Can Learn from the War. And I try to make the case in that article that the very things they're complaining about today could not have happened if they had not made government big enough to give George Bush, Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan, the others the power. He says, what no comment on Arnold. 
And I guess I haven't said anything about Arnold. Hey, we got a Ludwig von Mises fellow Austrian for governor in California. Yay. Arnold did graduate with a degree in economics. Arnold did say he thought Milton Friedman was a guru. First day, what's he do? He asked Bush for help. <laughs> Any thoughts? Can you say, I'll be back? Well, if you're talking about me being back and running for something again, no. The answer is no. If the Terminator is going to be back, well, we will see. But that brings me to another article that I have linked on the Radio Links page on the website. It's a terrific article by a liberal named Bill Press, who appears on CNN. And this really is priceless. It's satirical, but it is entirely true. And I'm just going to read the first few paragraphs of it to you, and you can go to the Radio Links page on my website and read the whole thing. He writes, Dear Abe Lincoln, you're never going to believe this, but the Republican Party has had a facelift. She has gone from the gipper to the groper. No kidding. You should see the old babe. Ever since she started running around with that Schwarzenegger guy, you wouldn't recognize her. She's an entirely different person. And I might interject here that for the rest of the article, he's referring to a she, which is the Republican Party, hanging around with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Remember how uptight she used to be about abortion? No longer. Arnold's pro-choice, so suddenly she's changed her position too. Now she says it doesn't matter anymore. You can be pro-choice or pro-life. She doesn't care as long as you vote Republican, that is. Same with gun control. God, I remember when they used to bite my head off if I ever suggested we needed any more gun laws in the book. Would you believe? Now, echoing her new squeeze, Arnold, she says she supports sensible gun control. Wonder what the NRA thinks of that. And gay rights. I'm telling you, it's night and day. Just yesterday, it seems, she was the biggest homophobe around. You name it. No gay marriage, no gay rights, no gay protections, no gay party leaders. Heck, she didn't even want gays or lesbians to have sex. Today, it's Arnold's rule. Straight or gay, who cares? Anything goes. Pat Robertson, Bob Dornan, Gary Bauer, and all those other Republican gay bashers can take a hike. Not only that, you should see how so-called conservative Republicans fell for this actor, Schwarzenegger. I'm talking politicians like Congressman Dana Rohrabacher, Daryl Issa, Chris Cox, and David Dreyer, and syndicated radio talk show hosts like Roger Hedgecock, Hugh Hewitt, and Sean Hannity. They don't agree with Arnold on anything. They're all outspoken, pro-life, anti-gun control, and anti-gay rights, or used to be, but they flushed their principles down the toilet once they found a Republican they thought could win statewide. They chose electability over conscience and power over principles. Suddenly everything our old girlfriend, the Republican Party, ever believed in was thrown right out the window. Or as Arnold would say, hasta la vista, baby. In fact, I'm not sure the party believes in anything anymore, except Arnold, that is. And there's more to it. He goes on from there. That's by Bill Press, who is a liberal commentator on CNN. Let's go now to New Orleans and talk with Cletus. Good evening, Cletus. Hi, how you doing, guys? Uh, I'm just fine. What's on your mind? Oh, that was a nice... <laughs> I, I was just listening to your little article you read there. That's pretty good, yeah. Uh, I did like it, too. Uh, okay. Anyway, I want to ask you a question. Maybe I'll get your uh, definition of it. Tell me what you think the difference is between right, the right to something, the privilege of something, and the duty. The, the, the right, privilege, and duty. Now, those are three different things that everybody should have. What, what's your take on the difference between those three things? Well, so I don't repeat myself. Did you hear what I said about rights? I believe it was just before we went to the I news. I certainly did. I heard you talk about the right to this and the right to that. But there's also there's such a thing as you have a privilege. I don't know what a privilege is, and that's just a privilege to do something. Well, privilege. by the way I defined it, the, there would be no difference between a right and a privilege. Now, I realize that conservatives and many libertarians mm -hmm. talk as though they are two different things. But if you have a contract with someone and that contract gives you the right to do something, well, it's the same as saying you have the privilege of doing something if you want to do it. Yeah. But what the state grants you is whatever right it's letting you have today, which is an effective privilege also. Now, conservatives and libertarians try to, some libertarians, try to separate the two and say that you have a right to life and liberty and so mm -hmm. forth, but driving is a privilege and I getting a job is a privilege and things of this sort. I, I, the way I, I think that, the way I really look at it, now I'm here in this little, if the local council that I have here uh, does something and said, well, it, it's, uh, we're going to give you the privilege to do something, okay? They're going to they're gonna give it to me. They're going to let me have it. You know, it's not something that I earned or that uh, the government came there, they said, you have a privilege to do something. We're going to let you have it. They have to vote on it and say, yes, you have the privilege to go uh, do something in front of your home, You have a, yeah, but you don't have a right to do it. We don't let you do it if we give you that right. Okay. Sure. Is that, but you said, that way I'm thinking or not? Yeah, sure, I understand what you're saying, but it just still comes back to the fact that even if you have a right to it, and even if the law says you supposedly have a right to it, it's only as good as what the politicians will let you do, yeah. what the police will let yeah. you do. And, exactly. and so rights rights are something that we like to talk about. But, you know, if you think over your entire life, try to ask yourself, try to discover in your entire life when exercising your rights actually accomplished anything. Yeah, okay. Now, the other thing, uh, we, you know, the other thing comes about Rush Limbaugh, and I've been uh, listening to him for many, I even have a big letter I wrote back in 19, way back when he had his TV thing. I went to the editor, 
And I had my opinion about him then, and I still have the same thing. But anyway, I, I hope he only gets done what he would do to any other person doing what he did. If he condoned, participated in, and helped the drug cartel do what they want to do, then I think he should stand up and take his punishment. But otherwise, I think it should be just like anyone else. Well, you know, I would, I guess, have to say that I would take the opposite position. I would hope that he does not go to prison because I don't think anybody should go to well, prison. I didn't say for what I he did. Go to prison, just treat him like anyone else. You see what I mean? Right, I but, but but he's not going to be treated by anyone. But what I'm hoping is that what has happened to him will make him realize that what he has been saying in the past about the need for draconian drug laws yes. is obviously not right. He's an influential person, and he may lose some listeners if he begins to back off and soften his stand on the drug war. Mm-hmm. And if he, But if he does, he will, in my opinion, and probably yours also, be doing an awful lot of good to take a lot of the violence and crime and corruption mm-hmm. and tyranny out of the American drug laws. Yeah. And that would, be, that would be the best possible outcome that I can see. If he were sentenced to prison, then he would never, even if he, even if he were converted, he would do no good because he'd no longer be talking to a million people every yeah, day. I, I, well, I, I, don't, I don't wish him any bad luck. You know, but I know I, you I, don't. I, I don't. I don't agree with a lot, lot of things that he has said and done. And I think he goes overboard on lots of things. He sure. Lots of things. I understand, but you and I are both benevolent people. We don't want to get back at anybody. <laughs> thanks for calling, Cletus. Okay, we got to go. I'll listen to you. Good. Thanks, for, thanks so much for calling. We'll be right back, folks. I was talking earlier about rights, and it is not a subject I've talked about publicly before, so I may have trouble making myself entirely clear on this. And my position on it is so heretical to conservatives and to, I think, most libertarians that it may seem shocking at first that I, who represented the Libertarian Party, feel very, very strongly that there is no such thing as universal, absolute rights, that man is not born with a right to life, liberty, and property. Try telling that to somebody who lives in Iraq or in Somalia or in any of 90% of the countries of this world where those rights aren't respected. He can think about it. He can believe it. He can talk about it, maybe to trusted friends who won't turn him into the secret police, but he can't act on that in any way whatsoever unless he himself can find a way to get out of that country and get to a place where such rights do happen to be respected at least to a greater degree than the country from which he fled. His only other alternative is to try to engineer a revolution in the country where he is and set up a system where for at least a while the legal system will try to enforce those rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so we have to recognize that standing up for our rights is not the way that we're going to get what we want in this world. We have to start with the premise that life is the most precious thing that you possibly can have because without life you have nothing else. You have no liberty, you have no love, you have no prosperity, you have nothing without life. Life is the most important value. And that's what's so tragic about the way that life is discarded, is ignored, is denigrated. When the Bush administration and its sycophants in the press and radio and television say, this really was a successful war, America has only lost a few hundred soldiers. Every one of those soldiers that was, quote, lost, unquote, was a precious life, a life that will never live on. As a nurse in the First World War said, why did these people have to die before they even began to live. And your life is important, and you should be focused on what you need to do to make the most of the limited time you have on this earth. And you should be trying to change the world only to the extent that you can do it conveniently, comfortably, enjoyably, and where you think you might be able to make some difference that might lead to something that will come back to improve the conditions in your life. That is selfish. But why should you not be selfish? You were not put here on this earth to make mankind better, to make the world a better place or America a better place. No one really knows scientifically for sure why we are here. We only know we are here. And some people say they have theories about what God wants from the world and other things. But these are religious beliefs and they are based on faith. And there's nothing wrong with faith and there's nothing wrong with religion. But it shouldn't be confused with science. Since you have this life and since you are here, you should make the very most of it. And you should not get hung up on what you believe your obligations and duties are to the rest of the world. But always when you act, think in terms of the consequences to yourself and to the people that you care about the most. And if you do, you will find the morality that can elevate your standard of living, elevate your enjoyment of life. But it must begin with you and not with what somebody else tells you you must do, what your duty is or your right. Thank you again for being with me tonight. I look forward to next Saturday night. This is Harry Brown. Good night.